to one whom we dearly love, but who shall here be nameless, this book is most affectionately inscribed. I want to warn you that the fidelity of this audio is going to fall apart. I want to warn you that the fidelity of the story is going to fall apart. The fidelity of this history is going to fall apart, is going to scatter. To one whom we dearly love, but who shall here be nameless. Maybe the fidelity of that nameless love, maybe that has a little staying power. Maybe in its obscuration, its refusal to fix itself on a single image, maybe that projects forward. We're going to do our best to communicate everything we feel like we need to communicate over the next 40 minutes, but something might get lost in the scatter. You see, this is work about entropy, chaotic decay, or maybe not decay so much as expansion. So that dedication to one whom we dearly love but shall here be nameless has haunted us throughout our research into this book and to all of the work that we've done since. Our gallerist, Devin Borden, did some research into it and he found out that John Wesley Carhart, who wrote the book that we're here to talk about, had a spinster sister who lived in Massachusetts. And given that Norma, his protagonist, leaves LaGrange, Texas to go to boarding school in Massachusetts, well, it seems likely enough that uh, Carhart's spinster sister is the nameless one but it rang particularly strong this last month as we returned to Oklahoma and to Arkansas to conduct some interviews and to dig further into the murkiest history that we've yet encountered, uh, which we're going to get into a little next Thursday in our performance lecture in Wilhelmina Grove, uh, because we were reminded of how many stories couldn't and still can't be told. Even a dedication as veiled as this one may have been a betrayal of trust. After all, in 120 years, a couple of artists and a gallerist with access to genealogy databases just might be able to put two and two together. I mean, who knows if we're even right. But it's a tension throughout our work, that balance between the good story and the need to protect folks, because the stakes can be so high. It makes me think of a meeting of the Houston LGBTQ political caucus, which we were members of last year, in which some young passionate members were arguing that voting membership of the caucus should be limited to queer folk. And a number of old timers knocked the idea down with points that I had expected, that our allies are our community, uh, that what it is to be queer is ever expanding and impossible to make neat boundaries around. But also one pointed out how audacious it was for these young activists to assume that it was possible or safe for all of our queer members to be out. That by making membership exclusively for queer folk, the membership card itself would become a signifier that not everyone can wear. And so we wanted to say that this talk 
and indeed all of our work is dedicated in part to those who have been and who continue to remain nameless. When we created a performance lecture for the installation that this book was based on, we set it up in such a way that we kept getting cut off. There wasn't enough time, we couldn't get it all out, and the attempt to transmit a whole understanding of the piece and the text it was derived from was constantly frustrated. In subsequent years, we started to wonder if the universe is really all that adversarial. Maybe it's not about getting cut off, but about letting go, letting in a little breath, a little wind, a little scatter. Okay, let's get a few base facts out here, because if you only go home with one thing, it should probably be a few base facts. Um, so that you can relate this story to somebody else and pass it on, or maybe mess it up a little bit, which is okay, we don't demand fidelity. John Wesley Carhart, the author of this particular work that we're discussing tonight, he has got sort of an astonishing biography. He was a traveling minister from New England and eventually found his way to Racine, Wisconsin, where in the early 1870s, tired of the time that it took to get from house to house and town to town, he invented a small two-cylinder steam engine, which is understood as a critical forerunner of the automobile. And he was eventually recognized as the quote-unquote father of the automobile by the magazine The Horseless Age in 1903, and he was honored at the Paris International Automobile Exposition in 1905. And anyhow, in the 1980s, in the 1880s, he decides to get a medical degree, as one does. And after bumping around a few small towns in Texas, he ultimately moves to LaGrange, just southeast of Austin, where he sets up a private practice. In 1895, he writes, Norma Trist or Pure Carbon, a story of the inversion of the sexes, which is then published by Eugene von Beckman in Austin, uh, which is where we intersect with him because it is one of the earliest, if not the earliest, example of American fiction with an unambiguously lesbian protagonist, Norma Trist. And we will get into the novel in just a second, but we realize a very quick sidebar here, uh, in case there's anyone who's new to us and to our work. Our life's work is a series of installations based on really early LGBTQ histories from every state in the country, and it's called the 50 States Project. So, our kid is into space. He's mostly into things that are objectively cool. And one of the unexpected joys of parenting has been the continuous reminder that we have forgotten to pay attention to the things that are obviously the most interesting. Like the first time we took him to the zoo lights at the Houston Zoo with promenades of oak trees wrapped in lights pulsing in sync to music and smoke-filled bubbles that burst under black lights and psychedelic floating swirls, animals outlined in LEDs, laser displays on fake cave walls. Anyhow, we left the zoo and walked through the parking lot and more exciting to him than anything we had just seen were the parking lot LED streetlights, impossibly tall and casting these gorgeous pixelated shadows, clearly the piece de resistance in the zoo's holiday lights display. All of which is to say, his interest has reminded us that space and all things space exploration are astounding. And so it was that a few weeks ago we were listening to Guido Tonelli particle physicist at CERN talk about the new space telescope, officially named the Webb, though we tend not to use the name in our house because why should we equate this extraordinary tool for expanding human vision with the administrator who oversaw a massive purging of queer employees from NASA? Anyhow, Tonelli was answering the rhetorical question, why are we trying to see the Big Bang? And he spoke about the importance of origin stories, not just for their literary merit or for what they tell us about ourselves, but for the basic health of our society. He spoke about the universal need throughout recorded human history to create and record and retell people's origin stories. And he argued that without some origin story, there can be no strong or cohesive society. 
it turns out that in a lot of ways our queer origin story is pretty sparse. It has been burned and buried and hidden and erased. And we are part of the legions of queer folk, historians digging through archives, drag mothers passing down oral histories, activists creating and fighting for spaces around the world where we can live long enough and openly enough to learn who we are. As we build our origin story, which, like all the others, is bound to be some combination of things that really happened and things that might have happened and things that should have happened and things that could never have happened. We are helping to build that strong, cohesive, and resilient society. About seven years ago now, uh, we were sitting in the stacks of the Fondren Library at Rice University, uh, going through anything queer and Texan that we could find, and we came across an essay by Kim Emery called Steers, Queers, and Manifest Destiny, representing the lesbian subject in turn-of-the-century Texas, uh, in a journal published out of UT Austin in the early 90s that mentioned the novel. And it turned out that Fondren had a copy of it on microfilm in the basement. And we sat there in front of one of those beautiful old machines, humming with fans, and we read the whole thing, increasingly amazed by what we were encountering. Subsequently, after deciding to make an installation based on this microformed novel, uh, we learned that here in Special Collections at the University of Houston is an actual copy of the book, and that the Houston Public Library has digitized a copy of the book that you can download. At first, when we learned this, we felt a bit silly having worked from the microfilm. The piece we made involves creating a custom font based on the original typeface and preserved on that film, as preserved on that film, which would probably have been easier to do from either of the other copies. But somehow it feels right that we encountered it in the way we encountered it. It's not just that microform is very beautiful, and the glow of the machine is very romantic, though both are true. It's also that there is something about how material is archived that profoundly affects how we receive it. Because this novel was on one microform roll of a series of rolls that had an endless collection of obscure 19th century novels and wasn't in an LGBT anthology or database, it helped us feel the thrill of uncovering a hidden gem. We even managed to get our hands on an old microform machine to put in Devon's in our first show, trying to figure out how to grapple with this text. We sat at the machine and read the entire text of the novel into clear bags, capturing our breath as a voluminous sculptural presence. The character of how queer material is archived is so interesting. We're currently researching our Utah piece, which involved going to the University of Chicago Special Collections to read the original unpublished character profiles of queer hobos in the 1920s that were compiled by sociologist Nels Anderson and I've never seen a place so rigid. It felt like everyone was afraid they were going to get in trouble. And all of the rules of a reading room were made so much more strict than anywhere else we've ever researched. And I felt like I wanted to liberate these documents from this sterile dystopia. Of course I didn't. I followed the rules to a T. And then shortly after, we went to the One Archives, now housed at USC. And it was this glorious, casual place, closer in spirit to all of the independent queer archives, like the Happy Foundation in San Antonio or the Gulf Coast Archive and Museum for Gay and Lesbian History here in Houston. Anyhow, it got us to thinking about what queer archives ought to be. Anyhow, back to Norma Trist. It is a pretty amazing piece of work. It's as if Carhartt was trying to hide the kind of psychological medical study that one might usually submit to academic journals inside of a dime store novel, uh, so as to avoid scrutiny and censorship, which only worked so well as the text was eventually reviewed in the medical press and he was arrested on obscenity charges, uh, which were eventually dropped. Much of the academic work that echoes the landmark German text on homosexuality, Psychopathia Sexualis, which hadn't yet been translated into English, 
exists under the rubric of a criminal investigation and a trial that ensues from young Norma attempting to murder her lover when the lover marries a man while Norma is away at boarding school. And it's staggering stuff for 1895. And so we thought that we would invite uh, some friends here to read the text of this scene with us. And we are so grateful that Lovey Olivia and Walt Ziprian agreed to lend their voices to this evening and bring Norma and her prosecuting attorney to life in one of the scenes from this investigation and trial. So please help me welcome Lovey and Walt. Norma was the first witness called in her own defense, having previously been notified by the court that whilst she could not be compelled to testify, she was at liberty to make a statement on her own behalf with the understanding that it might be used against her at some subsequent time. The facts as set forth in her testimony have already been given substantially in the previous chapters of this story. She said that she never knew what love or desire for the opposite sex was. The first dawn of passion at the age of 13 was for those of her own sex, but that she never devotedly, passionately loved anyone except Mrs. Lamoureux, now Mrs. Rodriguez. Her passion for her occurred soon after she commenced to receive instructions from her in music. The awakening of the passion was sudden and powerful, absolutely irresistible, and as love thrives by what it feeds on, being much in her company, her passion for her increased until love for her was the ruling passion of her being. The object of her absorbing passion was largely her thought by day and her dream at night. All of her dream pictures were of her teacher, the object of her affection, or of female forms in general, never of the opposite sex. Norma's manner was frank, without equivocation, and apparently unembarrassed. Her statements were straightforward, with no false modesty or any attempt to conceal facts, no matter how delicate they might seem. And her testimony evidently carried conviction to the mind of the judge and to the more intelligent of the spectators, both male and female. She was asked if the lady, her teacher, for whom she entertained such an ungovernable affection and erotic passion, knew of the character of her love for her. And after a moment's thought, as though unwilling to seriously reflect upon the lady, she replied that, no objections were ever made to her advances or to the character of her passion for her. She was asked, was there ever a time in the history of your passion when you could have resisted it and have overcome the infatuation? I beg leave to state that my love for Miss Lamoureux, my dear Marie, is not an infatuation and never was. To me, it is as pure as the deepest, purest, most God-given passion between two of the opposite sexes can possibly be, and I may modestly say as in intelligent. I wish to state further that there was never a moment from the time I first experienced a divine passion for my dear Marie when I wished my love for her to cease or even to grow less. The stronger the passion, the happier I was. It was and is a stimulus to my in ambition prompting me to highest intellectual effort, inspiring me delightful, unflinching courage, so that by the power of this innate inspiration, I am unborn above the sordid affairs of this life. Then you love Marie as you style her, yet do you, Norma? I do love her as devotedly as any knight ever loved a lady. Did you love her when you struck her down in the street with a dagger? This question was exactly And the court held that she need not answer it, but Norma expressed a desire to answer it, and the objection being withdrawn, she said, I at first thought, in my jealous frenzy, that I was angry with Marie and wanted to kill her in revenge. And as I tried to analyze my feelings, I think there was something of this feeling until I rushed upon her when I instantly realized that it was bewilderment of jealousy from the love I bore her, and I would much rather have received the blow in my own breast. Lifting her eyes heavenward as the tears coursed in great drops down her beautiful face, 
she exclaimed with deliberation and profoundest emotion. God knows that I could, at that awful moment, have died for her. All in the courtroom were visibly affected. The judge raised his glasses from his eyes, wiped them with his handkerchief, and as if to clear his vision, made an effort or two to clear his throat and said to the counsel, <clears throat> are you through with the witness? I have but a question or two more. Norma, do you realize that there is anything abnormal in your affection for Marie? Nothing abnormal, whatever, that I know of, except as to the fact of its being love on the part of one for another of the same sex. You realize that such a state of things is not according to nature? It is according to the profoundest and most irresistible instincts of my nature. So you realize that you are not as others are? I am painfully aware that I am not as the majority of people are, and also that I, am, that I may be regarded as not in harmony with the common sentiments or wishes of society. Have you ever been troubled in your conscience over this matter? I mean, your love for Marie? None, whatever. No more than one would be likely to feel who sincerely loves another of the opposite sex. Love between the sexes is natural, that is. God-given, my love for Marie is according to my nature, therefore God-given and right. There is one more question I should like to ask. And it is a somewhat delicate one, in which the lady will not answer unless she chooses to do so. If she chooses to answer it, she may do so in her own way. There was manifest, intense agreement, eagerness on the part of all present to catch the question and the answer. The ladies, of whom there were many in the courtroom, showing the greatest anxiety, created some rustling and confusion, which was instantly suppressed by the bailiff shouting, order in the courtroom. I wish to ask you, Norma, if in your relations with Marie, your love experienced perfect satisfaction. Norma, apprehending the exact purport of the question and wishing to relieve him from all embarrassment, said, I understand you to mean satisfaction of the erotic desire? That is what I mean. I have no hesitancy in answering frankly and freely that my love for and relations with Marie afforded the highest and profoundest satisfaction of which the entire human being is capable in the realm of human love. That is sufficient. I have no more questions that I wish to ask. And at that point, the court adjourned for dinner. Thank you both so much for reading this scene with us. <laughs> So, this novel became the center of 50 States, Texas. The installation consisted of the unabridged text stenciled in loose graphite powder over 100 linear feet of paper. At the top of each of the 32 chapters, we added a stenciled graphite image of what currently stands at the former locations of gay and lesbian bars across the state of Texas, from Galveston to El Paso. When we first moved to Houston, we were introduced to Professor Raul Ramos, who introduced us to another recent Houston transplant, Roberto Tejada. And as we talked to them both about our earliest thoughts uh, for our Texas piece, Roberto suggested that we might check out Cabeza de Vaca's La Relacion, his 1542 relation of his journeys across what is now Texas, in part because he wrote of encountering homosexuality and gender variance among a couple of Native American tribes. And uh, but we are going to stay on topic. Um, generally, we get really excited about it, but we weren't really sure where it was going to go. And then eventually, as we started documenting what now stands where there used to be queer spaces, to illustrate Norma Trist, we realized that we needed some organizing principle. 
And so we organized our photographs along the traditionally understood historical route that Cabeza de Vaca took. And in the early thinkings around the book, we were actually considering including collaged landscapes as something of a background to the text. Uh, we hadn't yet settled on the one bar per chapter idea. Um, of course, now there's some compelling research based on the plant life that Cabeza de Vaca references uh, that suggests that you went a completely different way, uh, largely in what's now Mexico, and that the traditionally understood roots are probably the result of folks who lived in big Texas cities in later years thinking that if they wound up there, surely Cabeza de Vaca did too. Um, but anyway, uh, getting at this expansive journey and the enormity of Texas led us to wanting to print the full text as an accordion-folded, continuous length. Tonight is actually the first time that we've seen the text unfolded all the way. So, uh, back to the installations. The text is left open to the elements over the course of its exhibition, and slowly, or not so slowly, it degrades from air currents, from errant fingers, from insects a fragile and tropic vanishing record of a fragile and tropic vanishing history. Insects in particular left some rather stunning marks. We eventually learned from an entomologist friend uh, that these tracks are consistent with the foraging behavior of beetles, although we never saw this particular collaborator in action. As we were deinstalling the work for the first time, we began thinking about ways to make this exceedingly impermanent printing of the text into something archival, a way to preserve the impreservable while staying true to the spirit of the installation. With this in mind, we started talking to Catherine Brimberry at Flatbed Press in Austin. We brought her images of the insect tracks and we talked about the spirit of this entropic, fragile, ephemeral thing and our wish to preserve it. And she, with decades of expertise and a wild sense of adventure, created this hybrid print technique that we never could have imagined. Intaglio etchings with a custom mixed graphite based ink flocked with loose graphite powder, which was then blown off and fixed. to our collaborator tonight, Andrew Lynch, who some of you may recognize from his stint last year as a Mitchell Center Fellow. How do we turn this lecture into something that can hold the same insect scatter entropy as the project itself? How do we find a form that walks that line between intelligibility and entropic decay? One of my favorite parts of that discussion has been Andrew's characterization of the prompt as a provocation. I think moving forward, it's a nice way to be thinking of all of our work as provocations. I think we may adopt that word as a guidepost. The livre, which is an edition of 15, contains six folded prints, and each one utilizes one of the bar images from the book and one of the more notable excerpts from the text relating to same-sex desire. The first is an image of what now stands at the site of Mary's Naturally. Houston's equivalent of the Stonewall Inn, and the excerpt, because I loved her, was the only and invariable reply. The complete image is silk screened on the exterior of the fold, and the print is a polymer plate etching done in a graphite based ink that was flocked with loose graphite powder while it was wet, and subsequently was fixed so that it could be archival. While the prints won't stand up to intense abuse, they are fixed, they are stable, they are archival. And to make each of these images, we created essentially the same process that happened naturally during the first installation. So we created a full-size stencil, sized to the finished print scale, and stenciled loose graphite powder, and then we introduced invertebrate collaborators. We photographed the subsequent result, and we used those photographs to create the polymer plates. I want to be clear, this was the fourth time uh, that we attempted this, because it seems that when you are actually interested in nature disturbing your process, it decides to disturb your process by refusing to cooperate. We laid out a couple of sets of stenciled images in the original location of the installation for three weeks. Nothing. We laid them out in a dry rotted industrial space full of little insects for three weeks. Nothing. 
we ended up having to build an insect corral and we introduced our insect collaborators into it. And even then, it took a number of false starts until we found the right ones for this project. And this, by the way, was not the right one. We keep talking about entropy, the second law of thermodynamics. This idea that there's a tendency in the universe toward disorder, randomness, uncertainty, scattering, but it's not about disappearing. At its core, it's about expansion and heat and processes that cannot be reversed. The energy flowing from a hot room into a cold drink, increasing the heat, the disorder, the entropy within the glass. The dispersal of pigment in water, this is from 50 states, Louisiana, of graphite powder along a page, but the thing that feels the most poetic, if you're looking at interacting systems like our aforementioned room and glass, when you zoom out, there's this kind of balancing that happens. The room increases the entropy in the glass by heating it up. But in that heat transfer, and some of the disorder, that heat is lost from the room. It becomes just a little more ordered. Or maybe, for our purposes, let's think of a hot glass of tea in a cold room. The heat, the life, the chaotic energy of the glass dissipates into the room, and while the glass loses some of its energy, it warms the space around it. The second etching is an image of what used to be Uncle Charlie's, a bar that sat in the shadow of the Texas State Capitol Dome. And the excerpt is, Nothing abnormal whatever that I know of, said Norma, except as to the fact of its being love on the part of one for another of the same sex. One of the things that I love about these prints is the combination of etching and flocking and what it does to the depth of the image, that it's both incised into the paper and projecting up from the surface. A few years back, as part of Countercurrent, a wonderful festival of experimental performance that the Mitchell Center put together for a number of years. The artist Carrie Schneider had put together a series of panel discussions that brought together artists and University of Houston faculty from non-art disciplines to discuss various issues related to the work in the festival from a cross-disciplinary perspective. And there was one in particular that involved an evolutionary biologist whose work mostly related to how certain fish could make extraordinarily fast evolutionary changes in response to changes in their environment. Changes that many people had previously assumed could only happen over many, many, many generations. And he was in this room full of artists and we all kept lobbing questions at him about how his work might operate as a model or metaphor, or architecture to understand human behavior. And he kept saying different versions of, you can't make that leap. I'm talking about this narrow scientific phenomenon among these species, and you're extrapolating out to human nature, and as a scientist, I can't agree that there's any relationship. But we're artists, and our whole life is about making those leaps. So, physics be damned. I think there's something in this sort of layman artist definition of entropy, our hot glass in a cold room, that suggests that these queer histories and their entropic impulse somehow warm the rest of our human room. That these particles and powders unleashed into a chaotic atmosphere actually alter the space they're dissipating into. At least that's the metaphorical version of my pop science that I'd like to believe in. I think for me, it's like some kind of quiet communicability, a good kind of contagion, like our little gay graphite granules or some kind of probiotic treatment for the rest of society. I think there's a lot of the world, and I think when we started the 50 States Project, we were probably part of this way of thinking, that thinks of queer histories like appendices to our broader human history, like Oh, look, we happen to be there and there, and Leonardo da Vinci was one of us. How fabulous. Like something stuck on at the end that you might look at after you've read the whole text. 
But I think these entropic invasions in our work, indigo paste in water, breath from leaking bags, graphite powder, I think there's some kind of attempt to reposition these histories not as appendices, but footnotes, woven into the text, fundamental to our understanding of what our broader American or world or human history actually means, what actually happened. The third etching was of the country. San Antonio's answer to Mary's Naturally, or the Stonewall Inn, and the phrase, it is according to the profoundest and most irresistible instincts of my nature, she replied. One of the other benefits of the flocking is that it also introduces a certain amount of entropy into the addition. Certainly the etchings and the flockings are all exceedingly consistent over all of the prints, but the subtle differences in the marks made by blowing away the excess graphite powder give each print a little bit of a fingerprint, which feels right spiritually for this project of a permanent impermanence. So the cool thing about Norma Trist is that despite being this total outlier of a novel, Norma is in a lot of ways a prototypical Western hero. It's funny, when we moved to Houston to research our Texas piece, we figured we'd probably make a piece about cowboys or border town red light districts or something before realizing that what we thought of as interesting about Texas as outsiders wasn't really interesting to the people in the community that we began to know. But in a roundabout way, we wound up making a piece about that Western cowboy hero anyway. Well, not so much cowboy, but. In the fall of 2014, we spent several weeks watching every single John Wayne Western that was ever made. 83 of them, to be specific. It was part of a body of work we were calling A Marriage to Western. Ultimately, a portion of that body of work ended up becoming our 50 States Wyoming piece. But at this moment, the whole thing was about positioning or locating queer identity within the iconography of the American West. Our previous work, A Marriage One Suburbia, had been about situating ourselves as a gay married couple within the landscape of the nuclear family, a suburban house, green lawn, two and a half children, as we reckon with the joy and loss and gift and horror and all of our ambivalence toward the mainstreaming of queer culture, particularly as it related to the advancement of same-sex marriage. This body, Wester, was about the lone figure in the landscape, the Marlboro Man, the rugged masculine American hero, the John Wayne of it all, almost as a counter-argument to suburbia, like, if we could claim both ends of this spectrum, then we were clearly interwoven in the whole damn thing. Though, like a dog catching a car, I'm not sure that we knew then, or now for that matter, what we would do if we successfully laid that claim. Anyhow, John Wayne, 83 Westerns. What we were doing was repeating every word that John Wayne ever said in one of his Westerns, verbatim, repeating it after him and capturing the resulting breath in a series of plastic bags, which were then tied and suspended overhead, grouped by movie. Using our breath to create a semi-transparent physical manifestation of this specter, this straight as an arrow icon, the masculine American superhero. We were somehow superimposing that mythology over ourselves, giving it a body that could be looked at, held, tossed aside, turned away from, looked through like a hazy window. And tropically speaking, as we finished each bag, the air pressure inside the bags was greater than the pressure outside the bags, which is why they inflated and became this mass. But the bags are only so good, and over the course of the six weeks of the show, the bags begin to leak, gently filtering our breath back into the room using just a little of their imposing physical presence. A few of the movies, by the way, are very good. Most of them are terrible. Asterix. I know that earlier I said straight as an arrow. 
but there were plenty of rumors about Wayne's sexuality, and I think the general consensus among those who aren't otherwise offended is that he slept with a number of men. Fourth is Encounters, a lesbian bar in Odessa, Texas in the late 80s and the early 90s. And the excerpt in which Norma explains her love for Marie reads, it was and is a stimulus to my ambition, prompting me to the highest intellectual effort, inspiring me with delightful, unflinching courage, so that by the power of the innate inspiration, I am upborne above the sordid affairs of this life. All that's left of encounters in Odessa is an empty sign and the facade. The rest of the building has collapsed, overgrown with brush and young trees, utterly overtaken by chaotic growth. The front door still stands, marked by bullet holes, a convenient object of target practice. The point of all of this is that in those 83 movies, all 90-something hours of the Western starring John Wayne, he never once apologizes. He never once admits error and asks for forgiveness. There's a whole other talk about what that might say about our collective American ethos, and that probably explains more than a little bit about the rise of some of the more influential, if unsavory, politics of the recent past. But for our purposes right now, I think there's something in that bullheaded sense of righteous moral superiority that I would argue is a defining characteristic of the American Western. Even when we get into the anti-heroes of Sergio Leone, the internal code of our protagonist is never questioned. All of which brings us back to Norma Trist, who much like Wayne's embodiment of Western masculinity, never once apologizes or questions her ethical position as it relates to her sexuality. Not only does she deem her orientation to be natural and correct, but she makes the argument that as her sexuality is innate to her being, it is therefore God-given and by extension, morally unassailable. Fifth is the apartment bar in El Paso. And the quote, I feel no condemnation for aught I have done or aught that I feel, but oh, I dread the criticisms and scoffs of society who cannot understand and refuse to appreciate. While we're on the topic of entropy, about six months after the prints were completed, the medium from the graphite-based ink, which was a first-time experiment for the folks at Flatbed, bled faintly through the paper, creating these rather haunting images on the exterior of the folds, these sort of ghosts of these long-gone bars creeping up. It's almost like the counter-argument to the interior images. Here, instead of an image falling victim to time and scatter and obfuscation, the ghost image emerges where it wasn't originally supposed to be. Actually, I take that back. It's not a counter-argument, it's the same argument. It's the scatter, it's the bleed, the expansion, the entropic growth through the page. For what it's worth, they've stabilized now, and they don't appear to be getting any stronger as time goes by. But it has st gotten us started thinking that we're probably gonna make a whole series of verso prints where the bleed through is the intended finished surface and the actual printed image is never intended to be seen. Contrast Norma to what was going on with other heroines in the late 19th century. A friend turned us on to Henry Nash Smith's Virgin Land, the American West as symbol and myth a few years ago. And it sort of digs into American myth-making in the West as both real and imagined, mostly starting with James Fenimore Cooper's Leather Stocking series and moving forward. He describes how even by the late 1880s, the heroines in Western dime novels hadn't changed all that much from Cooper's basic model, sort of boring two-dimensional characters that lent gentility to the hero. This is critic James Russell Lowell on Cooper's heroines. Quote, they were as flat as a prairie and sappy as maples, end quote. As time went on, they got a little bit more agency, but the position was not fundamentally changed. Here's Henry Nash Smith talking about it. 
The genteel female had been the primary source of refinement in the traditional novel. One method of transforming the heroine from the merely passive sexual object she had tended to be in the leather stocking tales was to introduce a supposed Indian girl able to ride and shoot, who later proves to be an upper-class white girl captured long ago by the Indians. But this device, like that of disguising the genteel hero as a hunter, did not involve a fundamental change in the heroine's character. Beneath the savage costume, she was almost as genteel as ever a much more promising means of affecting a real development in the heroine was the ancient device of introducing a woman disguised as a man or wearing male attire. And this is where Norma actually starts to line up with the female heroines who were just beginning to creep into the Western dime novel, albeit very rarely. albeit very rarely, in the late 19th century. Full, leather stocking style Western heroes in and of themselves. Except that those other heroes are in some way transformed into men so that they can fulfill their role. Norma remains every bit a woman. And unlike the Calamity Janes and Hurricane Nells of the late 19th century, Norma's behavior is motivated not by vengeance, but by romantic love. Though, let's be honest, there's a little bit of vengeance, too. She does, after all, try to stab her lover in a fit of jealousy. Finally, we have, to me, it is as pure as the deepest, purest, most God-given passion between two of the opposite sex can possibly be, and I may modestly say, as intelligent, and an image of where our friend Susanna thought the ranch used to be. After we started photographing these bars in 2015, we got a frantic call from a friend of ours, Susana Monteverde, telling us that we needed to get to the corner of Buffalo Speedway in Maine, one of the country's largest lesbian bars. We rushed over to the surrounded by excavators and heavy equipment, poetic in its destruction, and then we got back to the studio and we started doing research. And we learned that the ranch had... We decided to include this image both in the text, where it's coupled with where the ranch actually was, and in the six etchings, because it gets at something that we continue to see. And the idea that sometimes some things that are not true in fact may still be true in spirit. Another thing that Torelli, the CERN scientist, we were talking about earlier. Another thing he talked about that felt resonant to us and our practice is how the reason we have been able to discover everything we have discovered scientifically over the centuries is that we have had a progressively increasingly sophisticated conception of the world around us. That it is less about the overthrowing of wrong ideas than it is about understanding things with greater sophistication. It feels like it speaks to the development of the 50 states project from the state of Wyoming with what started as sort of a rah-rah exuberance, this celebration of our ability to stake a claim to having walked through the great American West before the Oregon Trail had even been surveyed, to an increasingly sophisticated understanding of what it means to stake that claim. The guilt of manifest destiny, American exceptionalism, and our need to own what it means to be a part of every gnarly, murky, complex aspect of our national history. This novel is a case in point. It contains this strong, unapologetic lesbian protagonist and progressive defenses of her sexuality. And it also contains some exceedingly racist and anti-Semitic character depictions that Rather than editing out or covering up, we have drawn attention to you in the for the edition. We thought about this at the time as an effort not to pinkwash Carhartt's legacy, but it's not just about avoiding something or choosing not to hide the gnarly stuff. It's about owning it, incorporating it, and finding a little more sophistication in the process. That scattered, slightly blurry vision, the ghost image, the lost word, 
we're trying to get an ever more sophisticated understanding of what it means to be present in history by embracing those absences and expanding into them. Looking over each of these prints, what now stands where there used to be queer spaces and spinning cubicle shells and edifices scattered and dispersed and beautiful and complicated. It feels like a way for us of seeing our queer origin story beginning to emerge in trophic, sophisticated, beautiful, and scattered. Tropic, 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 tropic